honor that you agreed to come and chat with me about like consciousness and meditation because at least for me like meditating in the group with you has been absolutely amazing and just like a lot of expanding my own mind of like what I'm aware to, aware of and just being more content you know in the moment so I really wanted to help you know share this perspective with others and I'm curious for you like like was meditation something that you've like always done or it's like something you sort of discovered like through your life it started in really it started in 1989 so I just dated myself there <laughs> after the passing of my abrupt uh passing of my father, you know, who was uh, killed in a car accident. And then, but we were fortunate enough that a year after, Thich Nhat Hanh came over to Washington State for a, uh, for a lecture. And then we were able to invite him to our house. And we had a weekend meditation retreat there with him. Uh, and Thich Nhat Hanh, he passed away earlier this spring, um, but he's a, you know, a world-known uh, Zen master meditation. So that's, that was my, my beginning, my introduction to meditation, or, or at least the Buddhist meditation. I mean, you know, previous to that, I've done martial arts, so we had little meditation in that, but that's a that's a different type of meditation. So that was my first introduction to meditation. It was, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh, his style was very simple, right? Noticing your breath, walking with your breath, be, just be mindful, this you know, mindfulness concept. Um, so we didn't do anything like, uh, like, you know, like a Vipassana meditation where, you know, one point focus or open focus type of meditation. It's just simple. Okay, you're breathing, you notice your breath. Really simple. So I I didn't continue that. Well, I practiced that, but I was in college at, at that time. So very busy, you know, being young and busy, you know, I didn't I didn't really pursue the meditation part as a as a dedicated practice. Not yeah. Not until about 2002, I believe, somewhere around there, 2002, 2003. Um, that's when my grandmother passed away. And we have a, a monk friend from California came up and did her ceremony. And then, you know, at that time, was just, I was still, um, I had some kind of, I would say, little loss about okay what is my purpose in life and things like that you know the usual things you know yeah. when, you get, <laughs> when you get older right and 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 you know um and that that jogged back my memory with with Thich Nhat Hanh and so you know I, I talked to him and he said well you know I'm going to have a meditation retreat a uh seven day meditation retreat down in California. Why don't you come down and, and join, join us? You know, so that's what I did. I, I came down there, joined them. And the thing was that it was probably the turning point, I guess, for me. And that's, you know, to pursue a dedicated practice. Because of, like I said, you know, I had some, you know, your normal life issues you know, relationship issues with, you know, with people and things like that, with situations like that that couldn't solve. And then the fourth day of the meditation, first first three days was just crazy. Just sitting still was difficult, you know. And then when I was able to sit still, just like any beginner, you know, you hear you, you the constant chattering in the mind, right, in the head, you know. God, I talk too much, you know. <laughs> um, and then, of course, you know, the physical discomfort, you know, you, you've never sat that long before and you you end up sitting 10, 12 hours a day, right? <laughs> and so so that's that's painful, right? 
And, you know, you wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning, you know, you get to bed at 1030, you know. And so, you know, it was, it was, it was challenging, but, but I felt the benefit right away. The benefit of it, you know, the fourth day, um, I sat in meditation. It was the very first sitting, um, about five o'clock, 5 a.m. And then I saw in my meditation, I saw all the suffering that I, I had in the past. And, 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 and at that time, and I could see clearly why, you know, the root of the suffering, right? And I, I was able to get into, um, I would say, I would say if I look back at that, uh, jhana, first jhana in there, where there was just this, calm quiet place there's no tugging there's no resisting and everything was clear it is it's like my whole life was turned inside out for me to see and all the suffering that i caused myself you know it was clear and then you know i sat there for i don't know how long probably 10 15 minutes at least you know i'm just crying right I can imagine. That's like literally what I was thinking. I'm like, I can only imagine you just bawling. <laughs> yeah, I'm just crying. I wish, I'm sure I was kind of noisy <laughs> when I was crying, but, but, you know, none of that, you know, was distracting me. I just so focused. I was so clear about, you know, what was in my mind, what it was, was revealing, what was revealing to me. You know, I was just crying and, and, and the, the, not because of sadness. I, I was crying because I was so happy. I was free. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's like, it's kind of like overcoming a fear or something, right? Mm. Once you step over the line, you feel that sense of freedom. It's like, okay, I know where to go. I know what to do, right? And, and there's, there's this feeling of also forgiveness as well. There's this compassionate feeling of forgiveness. When, when you, you are clear about your suffering and, and, and you, you, you um, let go and you surrender to it rather than fight it, there's a sense of freedom that, that, uh, that you have with it. You know? The first three days, I had headaches. You know? it, was, it was so hard that I... It felt my head felt like a bowling ball. I mean, like it, physically keeping it up was was a you know was a challenge, right? But right when I I had that realization, everything was clear. My head was light. Everything was clear. I felt like clouds. Wow, you know, flowing. That's awesome. I yeah. mean, yeah. The, and then I guess like from then on, it's just been a dedicated practice ever since. Yes, ever wow. since. Ever since since then, I mean, there's there's a, I say there's been time maybe a month or two where, you know, get caught up in life where you know that yeah I can, you know get a little lazy and and you know but then I always bounce back you know it was you know it, it became part of life part of who I am where if I don't sit it's like not eating <laughs> you know mm, i right? feel that i feel that and i guess like did you always grow up like in like a buddhist household that that was something that was always sort of accessible or was just more something yeah. that you guys discovered you know just part of you know your your life journey yeah you know that's a that's an interesting question and i was born into a buddhist family right my, mm. my mother's side was all buddhist um, and then she bought Buddhism to my father's family as well when they got married, right? But her practice at that time were just chanting the sutra. There was mm. no meditation at all. But the funny thing is that her step two, she has two step brothers that, that have passed away. They were monks. Both of them were monks for 60, 70 years. 
Wow. One of them were, was a Theravada monk. In, he lives outside, outskirts of Paris. And, uh, and, you know, he, he lived there for, I don't know, 40 years or 50 years or something like that. You know, during the Vietnam War, he went over there in his late 20s, I think, or something like that. Um, and when he passed away, I think it was in close to 80, you know. But he was a Theravada monk, so he practiced Vipassana. You know, the unfortunate thing was that, you know, there was was a reference for me and didn't have the opportunity or the benefit of, 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 of meeting him. I've talked to him on the phone, you know, just a short conversation, but I never really knew him. Right. Mm. And so that's a funny thing, right? Yeah. You know, it was like, you know, someone there right next to you all the time, but you never took the advantage to. Not aware and of then it. At I'm the going time. out, I'm, I'm looking at for some from somewhere else. <laughs> right. When I started to meditate, it was interesting just because I had seen my aunt do it so much when I was a kid, but I was just like, okay cool i'm like whatever i kind of just you know wasn't aware of what it was really doing it's just something i saw and kind of dismissed right away but then like as i started doing it i was like yeah i understand why people do it just because you immediately are just giving yourself like the space within your own head to just like let that talking chattering just sort of like silence itself mm -hmm. or even just being aware of it and not like letting it sort of just like choke hold you right. um was just like a huge already big difference for like engineering and i was like oh this is interesting but then to me like when it got even more peculiar it was just like when you start to be aware of things that like were always there but you just didn't realize was there because mm -hmm. like you're focused so much on like the day-to-day -day experiences of just living and growing um and like craving constructing yourself that like you're not even aware of like all this other stuff that's like also happening and like for me that was when like meditation like really I felt like intrigued like even my internal curiosity because mm -hmm. I was like this is a thing that does some pretty interesting stuff but like mm -hmm. nobody's really like talking about it like it's not it's like few people on a specific path that go about this but it shows up in like so many different cultures and yet like people still I don't I think there's like so much misconception around mm -hmm. like what meditation does or like what does it mean to be mindful and I know like a lot we talk about how like language can be very confusing especially if like in like the Buddhist practice you have the Theravada and the Mahayana I yes hopefully I'm saying that right and mm -hmm. like they each have their own way of like articulating what mindfulness is or like the different ways you meditate or like what does it mean to be enlightened and like in the western society we hold on to concepts so much and like even me as like with this engineering background I like concepts because it's like okay like it gives me a roadmap to figure things out oftentimes like you say like it kind of gets in the way of like the whole practice and I'm curious then for you like how do you describe meditation to people that come into it with this like preconceived construction of like mm -hmm. what the practice is and like mm -hmm. what it's supposed to do for them mm -hmm. um when it's like the whole practice is like breaking all of those ideas that you even come into it with <laughs> yeah you probably notice um whenever we have a new participant in our meditation group the first thing is i go around and ask them what their ideas, whether they have an ex have experience in meditation, and if not, do they have any idea or understanding about meditation? Right. I ask those questions, and the next thing I I, I tell them is forget about all that you know about meditation. Empty that mind. Get rid of all that concept. Right then I lead them into a, you know, our guided meditation just with the breath. Cause I think that's important, especially if, if I don't know the person, you know, we're working together. So we have to start with a blank page. And then after that, once we know each other, then we can discuss differences 
or why are we using the technique? What is the difference between what they understand and, and what I understand? You know, mm. Not saying, not necessarily saying, okay, yeah, you, you're doing it wrong. That's not it, or you know, my way is better. No, it isn't. You know, there's there's many ways to approach meditation, and what works for one person is going to be different to another, depending on how their mind works. You know, if they're really technical, right? They 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 they're they're really good at at figuring things out or being really intellectual oftentimes you have to get rid of that part of how their mind works right because they can you can get stuck the meditation become more of a an exercise a mind exercise for them right Mm -hmm. Um, someone with a very open nature of a mind where they're they're creative, right? Anything happens, right? That means their mind is all over, could be all over the place. Anything is possible. Well, you need to tune that back in. A more focused attention is what that person needs. We need to balance that out. As you've continued your practice, how did you go about sort of assessing your mental state like as you progress in the practice because at least that's sort of where i spend a lot of time not necessarily judging my meditation Mm -hmm. but more of like trying to constructively assess like my level of sanity or like Mm -hmm. mental clarity Mm -hmm. um and i'm curious for you is that sort of the benefit of like going to retreats and being a part of a community because you sort of have like other people from which you can sort of express what it is that Mm -hmm. you experience and then um have sort of discourse to bring about like deeper understanding or like mm-hmm. give you sort of tools to probe deeper than maybe where you're you're currently at and you know mm-hmm. trying to trying to break through or unla- un- unveil layers I should mm-hmm. say not break through walls and, and peel peel back yeah. the yeah layers <laughs> yeah well you know my way of assessing my practice um, involves three things Really, one is a teacher, someone that you know, been down there, have the experience, where they you can talk to them and just describe your your challenges or your, your experience, and, and they can just you know they can they understand and and they can clarify things for you. You know that's very important, especially if if you've been practicing for a while and and, um, and you have a really good practice, then then the then you 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 go deeper into the practice. Everything's a lot subtler. It's mm. harder and harder to to see, right? Those, you know, it's it's just like okay, you can see a cloud, right? It's easy because it's big, right? But then can you see the dust, right? It's harder to see dust, right? But uh, uh, all that dust that accumulate can be clouds, can be as big as clouds. So you want to be able to see see that identify those things right mm. so similarly you know that's where the teacher comes in and has a you know big role to play with your your with your practice um, to hone in the practice is the long retreat because oftentimes you can sit for an hour like I sit one hour in the morning and one hour before bed that's two hours right so it's a considerable bit of time on daily practice but that doesn't get you that deep, really, mm. right? It doesn't allow you to see the subtlety, right? It's it, think about swimming, and then you see the jellyfish, but can you see the bottom? What do you see on the bottom there? So as as, as your meditation goes deeper, it's like diving deeper, right? More difficult. A little bit more difficult to breathe, so there's a lot more distraction. You know those, you know, and 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 you can't even see the the sand on the bottom, right? Um, so that's that's where the, the, the that's where doing the practice, doing the long extended practice, will help you. Is is allow you to dive deeper, right? Um, that requires more concentration, 
being still in the mind, right? Uh, maintain present. That's, so there's a lot more effort. Mm. And there's more effort, but on the other side is you want to minimize the effort. Yeah. It's like balancing the time. like the, right. the vividness with the relaxation. Mm -hmm. The teeter totter. So, right. Mm -hmm. So, so think about diving down, right? When you're on the surface of water, okay, you can swim, right? A lot of effort get you somewhere. But as you go dive down, the more effort you put in moving your arms and legs, you're just wasting energy. Yeah. So, what do you do? You allow you to, yourself to just enough effort so that you sink down there. Mm. Rather than force your way down there. I see. Interesting. Yeah, because as you say this, it's like I'm reflecting like my mm -hmm. meditation. Because like one of my goals this year is to really be like intent. Like I have it in my agenda. Like I meditate every mm -hmm. day. Because like I guess like is the benefit of having the daily practice more that it gives you the tools and like you're sharpening that like focus. So when you're on mm -hmm. these extended stays, you have the practice, you know, that kind of just gives you, instead of you having to work through all of that during right. that time, you can just really get to right. where you're trying to go instead yeah. of wasting it, trying to prep your mind just mm -hmm. to settle in the first place. Yeah, I'll, I'll give the, you know, I'll use the same analogy as swimming or diving, right? You're on the surface. The daily practice, you're up here. You're, you're practicing to stay afloat or, mm. or then as you come down, you're practicing to stay at that depth, right? If you know, the body tends to flow upward, right? Yeah. So diver have to have weights to bring them down, right? So, so your daily practice is you're going down here. So you're learning how to breathe, how to operate in that environment, in water, right? How you should be moving, right? You, you can't just, you know, wave your hands around in the water. It's yeah, not really, you're not going to get very far. <laughs> you're not going very far. You're going to be just spinning around, right? You're not going to be able to go get to where you want, right? So, so the daily practice teaches you how to operate in mm. that state, in, in, in that environment. Now, when you go to retreat, then you don't have to start from here. You've already established this. So you start from here and then allow, that allows you to go further. And the, the techniques that you use here continue, you continue to use that to help you go further. Mm. Right? And then just like, you know, seeing underwater, you have to allow the eye to accommodate less light, right? As you go deeper, right? Interesting. So you're sharpening your 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 ability to identify, to see your perspective. Right? So that's, that's the daily practice. That's how it helps you. And, and, yeah. and the extended practice. That's what it can get you know get you to, right? And I'm curious, like, for someone that has been meditating for as long as you have, I know one of the big misconceptions that people have is, like, when you meditate, your mind will go quiet. Like, it'll be quiet. It'll be still. You'll finally get a break from that anxious, nagging, doubtful, full of fear, just irritating voice that just won't, like, leave, you know, that people feel like won't leave them alone. Mm -hmm. Um the and monkey mind. I, yeah, yeah, exactly. The monkey mind that's like just constantly just looking for entertainment mm -hmm. to justify like, okay, I'm still here. You know, I didn't mm -hmm. just obliterate in the last second while I was breathing. Um, but I noticed like, even like as I get more focused, like the monkey is still there. But I think right. where the misconception at least I found is like, it's not that it goes away. It's more mm -hmm. of like you're less bothered by it. Right. Like it's there, but you're mm -hmm. like, okay, what's new? Like, hello, mm -hmm. it's good to see you again. Um, mm -hmm. But you're still like, like I imagine it's sort of like a ship in rough water and it's like mm -hmm. the waves are like trying to get you to like turn capsize, but you're focused mm -hmm. and your sails are set in one direction. And despite mm -hmm. all the wind that's like blowing against you, you're still mm -hmm moving in the direction that you're mm -hmm. intending to go and 
I guess like is that similar or do you actually yeah. reach a point where it is quiet? Well, there 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 were there will be stages. This is based mm. on my experience. There will be stages. You know, the be very be beginning. I just use water again, <laughs> since we're talking about you just stay, in, you know, in that concept is, um, you know, you're, you're in a rowboat, right? You're on top of the water, right? And it's rocking. The wind is blowing, it's rocking the boat, right? So you, you're being distracted by all that. So it rocks this way. So you, you want to maintain balance and so you rock the other way, right? So, so in, in that effort, you're rocking the boat as well, right? So you're, you're, you're not focused on where you need to go, right? And then you're, you're paddling while you're doing all this stuff. So you, the boat is kind of, you know, moving all over the place, right? Now, and so, but once you, after a while, you practice this, you figure, you, you figure the movement of the boat with the wave. So, it's just, so you can tell by the way where the boat is, how is it going to move? So you work with it, right? You're not fighting it anymore, right? Just like the monkey mind, you're not, you're not jumping from branch to branch with a monkey. You stop and you just sit and the monkey's still there. It's still running around. It's still jumping around, but you're not. So you mm. get to that point where the monkey doesn't disappear, right? The boat is still there. The wave is still there, right? But you're not being rocked by the by the waves. Now you can kind of concentrate and you work with the wave to 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 paddle towards your destination. Mm. Right? So the paddling is a little bit easier. You're not you know you're not paddling backwards. Right? Yeah, exactly. You're working, right, you know when when to to paddle and when to pause, right? And so so you get to that that point where okay still work but you're not there's no anxiety there right mm, right yes your mind exactly. isn't rock right yeah but that's so so is it's not like you empty the mind you empty the distraction with the mind mm, right? exactly exactly and like speaking of the mind, you know, since it's since this is like the root of everything, like I it's interesting because like you had me had an epiphany when I was like looking through some notes that I had and I was like this line right here that I wrote. I'm like that really like flipped things for me because like I grew up in like that science oriented sort of discipline of like we have the world outside of ourselves and like as scientists we're out here measuring things and like doing calculations and like we can predict and have become sort of masters of the physical world and we can do whatever we want and you brought up the point of like the nature of reality is a concept within the mind. And I was like, Oh, that like blew up like that entire like construction that I had of like, we're out here measuring this thing and coming back and reporting our findings to the rest of the clan of like, look at what we can do when it's like, all of that is just like a dream that we constructed and instead of it being like the dreams that we identify as dreams, this is just one that we, for some reason, as just like we're so identified with the main character and everything mm -hmm. about that main character that it's like, it's like we're we're having fun in the VR that we're forgetting that it's VR. Like it's so addicting right. and so like visually intensive that we're like focused on that and not mm -hmm. like everything else that's leading that to even exist and. Mm -hmm. I'm curious for you, like, how do you think of consciousness or like, because like, even when I was just learning about all of this, there's like all the different types that they claim are like, you know, within the total realm of consciousness. And it's just like this elusive thing that science is still trying to figure out, but it seems like the, the Buddhists, you know, they know what's going on and they've been knowing forever. And I'm curious, yeah, just what your perspective is on the mind and consciousness and sort of like the, this experience that we have, which is the present. It's literally a present. Like, I just think it's so ironic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's a, you know, that's a 
deep question there. I, I know. Not, it's, yeah, I'm not sure if I, I have a, a good answer for it, but you know, um, I think if I, if I can distill it to a simple concept, <laughs> is consciousness is we're always conscious. We're co- on something we have consciousness. It's not like we don't have consciousness. You know, all of a sudden we're just like a rock, and then in the next moment we f- we remember, then we have consciousness, right? So, you know, we're, all, we're always conscious. But is are we aware of what we are conscious of? Right. So, so that what that t- say is that are we present? with our conscious are we present with it mm. or or are we are we just operating through the consciousness of past pattern mm. right? the way that you think continue to think in the same way right so you create your own world based on your past experience and then you believe that to be true while the reality is here you need to be more conscious aware of it so there is an effort to be aware in the consciousness of your environment of what you're doing Mm. of your experience itself rather than being conscious as a reaction to what is and that that what the reaction is is based on your past experiences mm, right? yeah so, so you're you're still looking through the lens of the past so why not let go of that lens and just be present with have a little more focus enough effort that you're conscious with the present what what is revealing to you rather than seeing what's revealing and conceptualize it compartment and then take the path and label it then you're operating from that label Mm. rather than what is there i see i see yeah, I feel like it's like interesting how like it seems like very natural to constantly like see something, conceptualize it, label it and then respond to it. Like it's like that sort of like our just behavioral pattern mm-hmm. um, versus like when you decide, OK, I'm experiencing something, but I'm not going to judge it. I'm going to just have right. the experience mm-hmm. and see what happens rather than just mm-hmm. trying to anticipate what Mm -hmm. it will be and what will come with it and I feel like it's very interesting because like the engineering or like data driven mind is all about like living on the past of Mm -hmm. like understanding things from the past so we can predict the future rather than seeing what is here in the present and then using that as like inspiration to create Mm -hmm. a new future or to create a better Mm -hmm. one instead of just like oh you know this is what the numbers say, right. which is all based on reactive old information. And just like, yeah, like it's just, it's interesting that that's just like sort of our innate societal structure of like, we're always sort of reacting instead of mm-hmm. just taking a breath and just like being like, you know what, instead of just taking all of the history and all the weight of it, let's decide in this moment that we're here and we could do something different. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I'm, I don't mean to say that w- what we experience in the past and the information that we have, the understanding that we have is is useless or we shouldn't use it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's a proper way to, to use it. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Right. So, so don't take the past to deny the present. Right. But use it as a, a reference point mm. to realize the present. Hmm. Right. So, so there is a little comparison. Okay. But this gives me a realization of, ah, right now, the difference is this, right? I can use part of this tool to, to identify, to deal with that. 
or or you you're you're conscious you know, aware enough okay this doesn't work this is a new experience this is different in this way and therefore there is a unique solution right there's always a, every experience is unique in itself right and your approach should be a unique in itself the problem is is when we dis disregard that because of our knowledge or of our experience in the past and we just label it conceptualize it and using the same concept in the past and say okay this is how we're going to deal with it right mm. and so so you're missing the, the subtlety of the experience I, yeah, I see what you mean. And yeah, I think like that's one of the interesting things that I've recognized with just the mindfulness practice. It's like, it's not saying that like we should throw away, you know, everything that we know that's helped us function as like human beings. And like, like when you're living in the present doesn't mean that you forget to plan, you know, and put things mm -hmm. on your calendar or like right. have goals or like any of that. It's more of like, see the tool for what it is and don't mm -hmm. let it like enslave your mindset of like like we created time so that we can do things in a, in a society in a conscious society but we shouldn't be like stressed out about a future when the mm -hmm. whole idea of like having a future is just to give you sort of like a canvas to sort of like lay out your plans or your goals not be the thing that like gives you anxiety to the point where you can't even focus on the present because you're like wrapped up in a million things that haven't happened yet and are mm -hmm. all stories that you've just constructed about an event that again hasn't occurred you're just basing it off of um, past information and right. yeah i noticed like yeah being the present breaks breaks that cycle of like mm -hmm. you don't have to let the tool sort of run your life and you can use it for the tool that it is which is to allow us to you know find time to discuss things and to connect and to mm -hmm. just grow deeper understanding mm -hmm. and then i want to go back to to your your previous question um is about you know how how do i assess my practice right mm -hmm. where i'm at another important is sitting together practice with other and discuss our experiences oftentimes the answer could be based on someone else's experience what they they are sharing and you you can reflect back ah hey that's interesting because i've gone through that and and you know that's that's how you can assess as well you know the law you know the, the daily practice the long practice, a good teacher, and the friends that you practice with. All mm. those are very important, right? Because oftentimes it is, it's, you know, a lot of time the teacher can lead you, but they don't necessarily going to give you that aha moment all the time. It's your discussion with another practitioner that may, that's, that seems to be, my experience anyway a lot of those aha moments were from discussing with other practitioner or trying to answer a question another practitioner has mm -hmm. and and it makes you you delve into your mind deeper right and and, and you're investigating and all of a sudden boom you find the answer uh, maybe at first you didn't have a really good answer for that person, but 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 you're dwelling into it, you're you're you know investigating together, and then the aha moment just appear, hmm. you know. And it's it's funny, and sometimes you know you, you know you express that, and the person, wow, man, you got all the answer, and you know you, but you know that you just figure that out. You, you didn't yeah. have, answer, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know all the practice of the experience allows you to get there right mm, yeah yeah i get that and i'm curious like leaning into that like how is it when you are being sort of a teacher for other people especially in like a spiritual practice where a lot of the time people are on a spiritual journey because they're trying to figure out their life or figure out purpose mm -hmm. um, or just find like a point of connection with consciousness mm -hmm. um 
being a human and recognizing like, yeah, you don't always have the answers, but people sort of, because you're, you have the title of like the guide, they assume, you know, to some degree that you do and like you're supposed to know. And like, if you don't know, then like, how, you know, like, how are they supposed to figure it out? But like you said, you know, it is a, an experiential journey of sharing, but yeah, like, is it tough sort of dealing with that while also just, you know, you're trying to help people Mm -hmm. and help them alleviate their own suffering Mm -hmm. and mental delusions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I have my own mental delusion, you know, right. So yes, you answer your question. Absolutely. It's, it's difficult, right? I always have to remind myself like, okay, you don't have to have the answer, right? You don't have to have the answer. You 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 will not have all the answer, <laughs> you know, right? Uh, everybody's journey is different. It, there is unique, right? You may have the answer for yourself, but it doesn't apply to them, even though the path is similar. What they've gone through is very similar to what you have gone through. You have experienced, mm. but not, but it's still unique in, in a way, right? Unique to that person, and 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 so so the answer has to be relevant to that person, you know, not to you, right? As a teacher or as a guide, um, and so I have to be very careful about how I frame things. But I don't know if you notice that when I answer a question, I don't say, no, you're wrong, or you're doing this, you're right? I always lead with a question. I always question the questioner, right? So that I can have a better understanding and, and, and be accurate of what I'm hearing. Mm. And I've, you know, I often ask the question and I say, okay, do you mean this, 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 right? Try to just draw me in a little closer and, and have them see. And, and what that does is it requires them to think deeper. And oftentimes that's just enough for them to find their own answers. So, so I, you know, my belief is that I can guide you to find your answer. I don't have an answer for you. I'll share my experience, what I think it may be, I, you know, like, okay, this is what happened to me. And this is what, it, you know, what it is, what I, you know, what reveals to me. Right. And that person may be, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Let me think about it a little more. Let me investigate this a bit more. But oftentimes what I try to do is guide them with questions so that they find their answer. Mm. You cannot create enlightenment for another person. They have to express that themselves. They have to have that moment for Mm. themselves. And it's unique. Yeah. I guess like because enlightenment is one of those things that is also like has many concepts around it. And for a long time, I didn't even think it was something that was attainable. It was just like like some mythical superpower that only, I don't know, fables are written about random people that might Mm -hmm. achieve this state. But I realized just like in the time that I've been just learning more about the practice is that it is something that is attainable within a lifetime. And I'm curious like how um, you sort of conceptualize what it is to be enlightened because a lot of the time like I think – Yeah, there's just so much like mystery around what it means to be enlightened that people sometimes like their ego will misdiagnose and say they're Mm -hmm. enlightened because that's what the ego wants, like that Mm -hmm. label. Mm -hmm. Um, But in reality, that may not actually be what the state of enlightenment is. And yeah, I was just curious if you could speak, speak to it to just a tinge, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's what you said. What is the concept of enlightenment? That's a very good question. That's something that you have to ponder, right? Because generally, when they people say enlightenment, they think of the Buddha's ultimate enlightenment, right? Mm-hmm. 
they have this concept of, okay, you have to be like a Buddha. You have to have the enlightenment. That's enlightenment. Nothing else is enlightenment except for that. You know, in, 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 in the Buddhist term, his enlightenment is the ultimate enlightenment, right? But enlightenment is, what is enlightenment? I say enlightenment is overcoming ignorance and delusion about yourself, your place in this world, and the world itself, reality. Overcoming delusion and ignorance is enlightenment. So that, so what that allow us to realize is there are different levels of enlightenment, right? Something that you were ignorant of or your delusion that brings you suffering, unnecessary dissatisfaction continuously and you suffer from it, the moment that you have that, ah, it's my fault or, you know, or it's my doing. All I have to do is not do that and, you know, I'm liberated. To me, that's enlightenment. Overcoming delusion and ignorance, right? So that it doesn't continue to bring dissatisfaction and ultimately suffering, unnecessary suffering. Yeah, because I remember like when we were even talking about karma and like the reincarnation mm -hmm. um, or the idea of reincarnation, like you'd mentioned that we are constantly going through rebirths and deaths every day just through our own sort of like construction of our identity and the things that we experience in the day and like how our mental state will shift from emotional state to different emotional state and each of that is sort of like a rebirth of our conscious selves because you're moving from these mm -hmm. different states like rapidly mm -hmm. um and i guess like yeah like could you speak a little more to that perspective of like reincarnation mm -hmm. or like karma because a lot of the time i feel like people look at these things as like sort of the equivalency of like how christianity deals with death in the afterlife right um but this perspective is more of like a daily thing mm -hmm. like we have daily opportunities um where you can be enlightened fall out because you're experiencing some sort of emotional state get back into the present and go back to that state and it's like a constant cycle and each sort of moment that we get mm -hmm. is a new beginning to either continue in that state or you fall out and there's no judgment because mm. life is change and permanence. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If, if, if you think about, you know, um, the world, when I say the world, that means anything that exists mm. physically or mentally or emotionally, right? Or perspective, right? is this ever-flowing flux in constancy, right? So everything is changing, right? So the idea of reincarnation or, or rebirth, if you look, don't look at that way and you contrast it with constancy, that means, okay, this body is mine. It's, you know, I can touch it, you know, and when it's gone, it's gone. You know, so so you have exist and you don't have exist. So you you know when when you see things like like that on you know um, the dualism mm. perspective of okay is here since is either it either exists or it doesn't exist, then you don't see the inconstancy, the or another way of saying the impermanence of life of existence right when you don't see that then your your definition of rebirth is okay this body has to die before a rebirth happens but if you look at the body on a you know scientific perspective our cells is constantly changing 
dying, re rebirth, right? Regenerated, right? Our thoughts the same way. So we're we're flowing in this flux. This is this constant changing. Constant changes, right? So it may repeat itself. A thought can repeat itself, right? So that's a rebirth of that thought, that similar thought, right? Let's say anger. If the world was constant, if everything was constant, when you're when you become angry, you will continue to be angry for the rest of your existence. Like a terrible sent life sentence. Right? <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Now, but because everything's always changing based on on the condition around you, right? Um, then rebirth happen is a is is the process of that inconstancy, right? You're angry at one moment, and then all of a sudden you're not angry anymore because something's distracted you. You're happy now, and then another moment you have the same anger again. So you 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 are living as a angry person at that moment again that's a rebirth of your identity at that moment right that's so that's the perspective of of rebirth mm. right and so we as we operate in the world and based on on the contact we have with our world we play a, a different role every time we have this trillions of multiple personality, right? So if I had children, when I'm speaking to my children, I'm a father, right? So I'm going to, to um, act differently. I'm going to think differently. I'm going to react differently than if I were to um, act in front of a friend. If, if I'm in front of a friend, I take on a different role or a different life, right? Mm. You see that? But when I return to my children, I'm going to relive, I'm going to operate as a father. You see? We're always changing depending on the environment, what, what we're experienced with. Right? So there's a rebirth right there. So that one personality is different, all right? Your friend, you can be goofy as hell, right? Your children, you're going to be a little bit, you know, serious, you more, know, yeah. you know, authoritative, can, you know, right? Falsely you, you, put together. Yeah, you, you play know? that role, you know, just, in, just enough, just, you know, right, right. Until sometime, you know, they do something really funny and you forget that you're a father and you're, you're, you're doing something goofy and then you're trying to pretend, okay, no, I'm a father, you know, <laughs> right? So we're, all, we're constantly changing, moving in constant, you know, as a personality. So there's, mm -hmm. that's another aspect of, of uh, rebirth that you can think about, right? Yeah. So, 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 so when, when we talk about suffering, and rebirth, what are we, what are we talking about? Think about this uh, perspective: is that okay? We're trying to identify the personality or the element that creates suffering for us. What practice can we apply so that we can liberate that suffering? Mm. so that we can identify the becoming of that personality before mm. it becomes an adult, right? A suffering yeah. adult, right? Yeah. Can, can, can we stop it, right? Can we let go of it, really? Not stop, but can we let go? Can we just surrender and let go of that? But real, realistically, you can't stop anything. Right? You can only let go, right? How quickly can we let go so we suffer less and less? Instead of suffering for, for a minute, can we lessen that? 
instead of suffering for an hour or days or weeks or year where something happened between you and another person a year ago is already gone, except you didn't let go, mm. right? You cling to that. And then a year later, you, 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 you pass by that person. Also, the anger comes back up again, right? So you're 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 playing that role again. That that role is re, you know being reborn, right? And the sufferer follows it as well, right? Facts. This cycle of suffering, you know, and then that's you know in 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 that example is suffering upon suffering. That's what it's called mm. suffering upon suffering. You suffer from your suffering <laughs> because you didn't let go. Because yeah. of the illusion and your ignorance, you're unaware. Yeah, it's interesting to me, like, when I realized that, like, we each act as our own warden, you know, in our own mind of, like, like punishing our own, like, consciousness right. for not living up to something, not being something, being hurt by something. And, like, one of the things that, yeah, I will say meditation helped me see was just, like, I was tired of like playing that role of mm. like constantly needing to like check my own self. It's like, no, like it's fine. Like why, why are we doing this? Like, like you said, like it's things that happened in the past. This is a whole new moment. Why bring that here when like we're chilling right now, there's no need for all of that. But it's like, yeah, we get into a cycle and meditation helps sort of break that or like the breath really, I feel like is what breaks that. And, I guess I'm curious, like, for people that have never meditated or they just have this, like, elusive idea of it that, like, uh, only, like, hippies meditate or whatever, um, I guess, like, how would you suggest for them to just be curious and, like, take that first step? For me, I feel like it's the breath, right? Like, you're yeah. teaching people to breathe, right. which is, like, something that we do from, like, the second mm -hmm. we're in mm -hmm. this world, but we just sort of write it off like it's just another body function that just does its thing but right. yeah i'm curious like how you think um yeah folks could like, use their breath as sort of this tool to to break out of their own delusions and mm -hmm. just kind of help themselves sort of get grounded and mm -hmm. um sort of find reality for mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm. i believe the breath is very important in this practice it's very important because it's tangible for one thing, and it's always present, right? You can't take a breath that you've taken. You can't take the breath that you're going to take. You only can take the breath that is here and now, right? And that leads you to being present, right? You're completely present, and you're com that's the only point in time that you are completely alive the moment-to-moment -moment realization or, or, or aware consciousness that you have at the moment. The next moment that you, you lose that, okay, you're not alive, right? You're a zombie, right? right. So, so I explain it that way. And, you know, the breath is, is, is tangible, so it's a matter of, okay, asking them to just bring enough attention that you notice your breath. You don't have to do anything else. You don't have to change the breath. And if you, you know, if you, you guide them through that and they sit for five, 10 minutes and they have enough attention, put enough attention to where they have that focus, things that they worry about just kind of drop because they, they're putting effort here, right? There is no multitasking. <laughs> in living things come so fast that we it appear it may appear for us because of our unawareness inability to to be that sharp in our awareness to identify that things come moment to moment no two things come at the same time see because we're so slow at registering that it seems like we're multitasking, right? But, it, you know, that's not how the mind works, right? And, and so when you can bring them to the breath and have them 
just be interested enough to stay with it. And you ask him, okay, how do you, you feel? You know, do you feel neutral? Do you feel, do you have anxiety? You have, you know, most of the time it's no. That was pretty pleasant, you know. That was, was it hard? No. <laughs> it's very simple, right? That's, that's, I find that's the easiest way to get people interested and interested in themselves, interested in the present. You know, that just, you know, that short little practice right there. And from there, once they're interested, then you can talk a little bit more about the breath, about their mind, you know, and, and, and get them more interested in. And, and, and you know, and if you, you can show, if you can show them that they benefit from it, you know, that's when the curiosity continue, right? Mm, and if, if you feel that benefit, you know, it's there, right there and then. For you know, free. And, for you know, free, they say, right. they say nothing in life is free, but yeah. your breath is. <laughs> yes, it's free. And, and, and enough of the time is, is, you know, we, we breathe so, it's so natural for us to breathe. We don't think about it, right? So we, we don't value our breath. That's the thing, you know, if, if they, they know how valuable their breath is, worth more than gold, whatever, however, how much you, you make, doesn't matter. It will never be worth as much as your breath, right? Without the breath, whatever you have, is someone else's properties <laughs> from then on. Facts, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Wherever you have, whether that's, that's, you know, tangible valuables or emotion from another person, you know, a relationship, whatever you, you know, nothing is going to be worth of anything to you.